so good morning, everybody, and welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants program. My name is Jesse, and I will be your host for this kickoff event of our actual World Oceans Day. Now, World Oceans Day, for those who don't know, is today. It is June 8th, and classically, over the last few years, there's been this bevy of events celebrating and showcasing ocean researchers and explorers for this special day, but we have expanded it. We have metamorphosed into this grand, exciting adventure with 25-plus programs over an incredible week of events. If you've been joining us with the link below our Ocean Week series at Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants, we have gone to the bottom of the ocean. We've been on research vessels in the middle of the Pacific. We've talked about turtles and octopus and sharks and penguins and so much more. And we are right at our halfway point, which means there is so, so much more to come. And so if you guys haven't registered for our program later in the week, I really encourage you to check out that link below. Now today, I'm really excited to kick off our, our actual festivities of World Oceans Day with a truly exciting speaker. We are doing live by Pierre Nirandara. She is a best-selling author, a Hollywood film producer, and an underwater photographer from Bangkok, Thailand. She has visited 90 countries on all seven continents. There's only the seven, so you can't go any further from there. I guess your next stop might be like Mars or something. We'll see. We'll talk to her throughout the broadcast. But today, she's going to tell us a little bit about her adventures around the world. We're going to share some really cool videos highlighting some of her uh, tales of, of exploration and adventure. We're going to talk about one of the greatest events in nature, and I'm so excited for your questions at the end as well. And so without further ado, joining us live very early in the morning from LA, Pierre, welcome into the broadcast. So nice to have you today. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. Well, it's so nice to have you here. We've got classes joining from all over Canada and the US. Czech Republic, we had a group join from today. So 38 groups across the, the world, which is pretty exciting for us here for Ocean's Day. And so I'm curious, I, I, I aforementioned it a little bit in our introduction, but could you tell us a little about yourself before I dive in with that exciting TED talk you gave not too long ago? Yeah, of course. Um, once again, thank you for having me, Jesse, and everyone who's tuned in. My name is Pierre Nirandara. I'm a author, a film producer, and an underwater photographer, originally from Bangkok, Thailand, where I was born and raised, currently living in Los Angeles. And I spend a lot of my time on the road, traveling around, and also underwater, um, um, where most I focus on photographing big animals and telling stories, hopefully, to save our planet. Very, very cool. When did you get the scuba diving certification? I'm really curious. And you might mention this in the TED Talk, but I, <laughs> I always love to highlight it for students that they can get out in the water themselves very early yeah, on. Yeah, so I actually got my certification um, when I was, I believe, 14 years old oh, so maybe cool. ruffle around uh, the ages of people tuning in today and uh, but my first time ever breathing underwater was in um the what's called the bubble maker course which is for very young kids and I think I was like eight nine years old in a pool with the you know the scuba and was just completely blown away I don't think I had ever been that jealous before of mermaids in my entire life <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned Bubble Maker. You're literally the first person I've ever had on the broadcast talk about this. So literally from eight years old around the globe, the Patty Bubble Maker course allows you to have that experience. And I mean, as someone who's now dove all over the world, truly being able to breathe underwater is like black magic. It's quite amazing to have that opportunity. Like it's just, it, there's, you you do the, the full flow on the, the octopus and you, you get like to sip <laughs> air from that. And it's just the coolest experience in the world. So I'm, I'm so glad you had that chance. For our students, again, 70% of the world is open to you if you have a scuba diving certification. And I hope uh, many of our students take the chance to get started after today. Yeah, it's absolutely magical. And Patty's been really great in supporting me and my work. I mean, this actually got, just got this t-shirt from them with a whale shark on it. So hey. highly encourage <laughs> if anyone is interested in the water or kind of like, you know, maybe is nervous of the big ocean for the moment, but want to dip their toes in. It's a great, great way to get your feet wet. Fantastic. You can certainly start in the pool wherever you might be, even if you're landlocked. Well, Pierre, I, I know you've got so much to share, but I want to turn it over to your uh, amazing chance that you did on the TED Talk to highlight all this to begin. So I'll play that video and come back with you right after, maybe talk a little bit about the sardine run as a bit of a spoiler before we get Sounds into it. <laughs> I'll see you again in a second. Let's cue that up, everybody, and get underway. You can hear about all the wide ranging career that Pierre has been up to. I always thought backpacking was something only white people did. Growing up in Bangkok, which was arguably one of the biggest backpacker hubs, I was accustomed to seeing an endless stream of farangs, you know, the Thai term for white foreigner as they arrived in the country, armed with their rucksacks, guidebooks, and the wide-eyed hope. 
for adventure. Meanwhile, like many other Asian cultures, my Thai upbringing emphasized hard work, studying, and increasing one's level of comfort. The idea of purposefully throwing off said comfort to live out of a backpack was very, very foreign in all capacities. South African comedian Trevor Noah once joked something similar about camping. He said his ancestors didn't work so hard to get out of the bush just so he could go back into the bush. Backpacking to find oneself was not a rite of passage in the same way that it is in a lot of other Western cultures. And so, though my single mother always saw the value in travel, we were way more touristy than intrepid travelers. We opted for organized excursions, cruises, and trips with friends and family. The idea of ever going off by myself into the unknown was way too scary to ever comprehend. I was working in an office job in Los Angeles when a trip to South Africa changed everything. Far from the urban sprawls of Cape Town and Johannesburg lies part of the country that few venture to. It's where you can wake up to a blazing sunrise over the ocean, you can surf your soul away, and you can also swim with the biggest underwater migration on earth. This place is known as the Wild Coast. The sole purpose of my visit to photograph what's known as the Sardine Run. Despite its misnomer, the Sardine Run has nothing to do with running marathons. I am definitely, definitely not good enough for that. that. Maybe, Maybe the Blue Serengeti, the Sardine Run is, is an event larger in number than the wildebeest migration of Eastern Africa. Millions, Millions of fish, fish are moving up the coast, huddling into tight bait balls as a form of protection, the shoals often stretching for kilometers long. And with these fish come the predators that hunt them. Things swimming with sharks, whales, dolphins, even birds, as they're chasing around these fish in frenetic, frenzied feeding. Basically, if anyone has seen the TV show Entourage, I went from swimming with sharks in Hollywood to swimming with actual sharks. I spent my days in the open ocean, diving into bottomless blues and returning to the backpacker's lodge later in the evening to sit around a campfire with other backpackers as we jammed on broken five string guitars under the stars. I didn't really know it back then, but the experience would change my life forever. Upon returning to California, I couldn't shake this feeling of ennui, this restlessness that there must be something more. At that point, I was barely 24 and I was working at a talent agency representing book to film rights. But I often felt that I was spending so much time helping other people tell their stories that I was forgetting to live my own. To be so close to the creative process and also unable to do it myself was too painful for me to bear. And so I did the very un-Asian thing and I quit. As someone who's always been a chronic overplanner, the idea of a yawning, gaping unknown was absolutely terrifying and also surprisingly exhilarating. You see, life is hard for two reasons, because you're leaving your comfort zone or because you're staying in it. In scuba diving, we have this app called the Giant Stride. It's where you stand at the edge of the boat and you do a large step into the ocean. That was my goal to embrace, embrace the, the giant, giant stride and see the unknown. French poet Francois Rabelais once said, I go to seek a great perhaps. And so, strapping on my backpack, I left the familiar to go and seek mine. After all, we often regret the things we didn't do more than the things that we did do. I saw, I saw the slogan once at a bungee jumping spot in South, South Africa that said, fear is temporary, regret is permanent. That really resonated with me. And despite having an immense fear of heights, it was enough to encourage me to take the 200 meter plunge down to the abyss. Basically the most expensive seven seconds of my life. Very smart marketing. The goal of my trip was to do on a holiday. It was to be challenged, embrace discomfort, and to grow. And to also challenge certain myths regarding solo female travel. You know, most people warned me, you're going to get kidnapped or ransomed or murdered. Spoiler, I survived. I went on a solo backpacking across 20 countries and five continents, spending most of my time in Southern Africa. On this journey, I hitched a ride with a stranger in a hobby, swam with bioluminescent plankton in Colombia, swam with 20 whales in a heat run, as a, basically a mating ritual in Tonga, 
saw the world's largest bat migration in Zambia, trekked across landmine infested territory in Bosnia, learned how to surf in Mozambique, and of course, I swam with sharks. It was female explorer Frey Stark who perhaps said it best. To awaken quite alone in a strange town is one of the most pleasant sensations in the world. You're surrounded by adventure. Standing at the top of the second highest waterfall in the world, after hiking through sunshine, rain, and hail all in the same day, I remember thinking, I could be in the office right now. But the life-changing experience were, weren't always so bucket listy. You know, sometimes they're smaller, quieter moments of resonance, daily sunsets, you know, sitting in bumpy bus rides, sharing a dorm room with backpackers from all corners of the world, sitting in the back of a pickup truck as local kids chased after us yelling Mzungu Mzungu, which means white person, and then seeing them pause as their eyes landed on you as a solo female traveler and Asian wasn't a really common sight in that part of the world. In regular life, we're so defined by what we do for a living that sometimes we forget to actually live. None of that matters on the road. You know, the freedom to be whoever you want to be is immensely liberating. You don't have to carry any of that baggage that you did from your previous life, save for the actual bags on your back. And the transience creates this sort of freedom of expression and openness. Perhaps that's why they call it the open road. This was the magic of backpacking, disappearing off the map, reinventing yourself, making new friends. But amidst the beauty, there's also various forms of privilege that exist on the road. Gender, economic, color, religion, passport. Sure, I was roughing it by staying in eight person dorm rooms, but I was lucky enough to not live paycheck to paycheck and to be able to afford time off or to travel at all. And there's this term, romantic primitivism, which talks about the idea that noble savages elsewhere always have it better. And trust safaris on the road will often tout the perfection of foreign places, you know, frequently ones in less developed countries, Thailand, Bali, you name it. But this is merely a symptom of romanticizing and idealizing these cultures without really understanding them as a whole. I remember sitting in a four by four, winding up the Sani Pass, this infamously treacherous route that splits South Africa with the mountain kingdom of Lesotho, when we saw a man carrying firewood on his back. For me, it was a moment of stark realization that while some of us strapped on a backpack to go in, into the wild and eat, pray, love, living out these Kerouac fantasies, others carry things in their back out of necessity. We often forget that travel is a privilege and not a right. And in no place does this become more apparent than in Africa. My point isn't to disregard the fun aspects of backpacking, but just like embracing depth in scuba diving, it's to encourage you to travel a little deeper. The places we go shouldn't serve as just pretty Instagram backdrops relegated as you know, backgrounds for our journeys of self-discovery and self-actualization. We are real places inhabited by real people. Take the time to genuinely find out what that means. In my case, it meant learning about neocolonialism, the counterintuitiveness and the pitfalls of foreign aid, and depth trap diplomacy. Now, your vocabulary and vernacular may grow exponentially as a result. Some say that in the age of TripAdvisor and Lonely Planet, true exploration is dead. I would like to challenge that. If, I think that, that if you travel deeper, you'll find out that so much of the world has yet to be discovered. After all, I don't think Google Maps will go underwater yet. Africa challenged so many preconceived notions I had of both myself and the continent and showed me that no matter where we're from, we really are more alike than we're different, especially since it seems that every single backpacker knows the lyrics to Wonderwall. The thing is, travel can feel a lot like falling in love. Both have the exhilarating rush of discovery and that feeling of wonder. That's why road romances are so potent. They exist in this completely separate, separate travel bubble, and it's really easy to conflate hostels with home. You know, people want excitement, but safety, stimulation, and stability. And it's almost near impossible to achieve both, let alone permanently. 
It struck me that this dichotomy is perhaps best represented by a Volkswagen Combi, this common symbol you see on Instagram for the vagabonding van life. It's what humans crave most, both in life and in people. The adventure of the road and the comfort of home. And that's why, like a lost love, it takes time to get over travel. It's only after processing the reverse culture shock that its true value blooms in hindsight. Your heart almost feels like it's bursting from the richness of the places, the faces, and the people you come to know. You know, the world feels so much larger, yet also so much smaller and connected at the same time. There's really no way to sum up everything into a palatable lesson, a single one, except that the experience is larger than some of its parts. The true measure of how far you've gone shouldn't be by mileage, flights, or hitchhike rides, but it's really the distance you've journeyed within. The traveler writer Rolf Potts once said, exploration is not so much a covering of surface distance as it is a study in depth. I spent a year trying to recapture the serendipity of the sardine run. What I discovered was that you can never replicate that first time, but you can find so much more if you travel with your heart, your mind, and your eyes wide open. After all, isn't the transience what makes it beautiful? Swimming with sharks taught me to face my fears and find comfort and uncertainty, and to recognize that if you have the privilege to ever backpack, it is wholeheartedly an opportunity you should take. There's a common misconception that travel has no link to the real world, but by breaking out the traditional path, my time abroad led to working as a film producer for international stories, launching Hollywood's first super dining club, and was the inspiration behind my new novel, a book about questioning the comfort of ordinary life and going out there to seek that great perhaps. While in the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa, I found myself in a film set after meeting two crew members at the local hostel nearby. Flash forward one year later, and I was working as a film executive at Sony Pictures, and I was meeting with a South African filmmaker. Upon telling him about the story, he paused and he asked, what was the name of that film? Turns out he had written it. The best analogy I can think of while backpacking is that sometimes you'll run into the same people on the road. And similarly, if you follow your passions, you'll be surprised at where those roads intersect. I came back from Africa almost three years ago, but the memories constantly linger in the back of my mind. See, we age not by years, but by stories. And I spend a lifetime chasing stories to tell when I'm old. In turn, I'd love to encourage you to live your own story and to embrace that giant stride into the unknown. Thank you. Very, very cool. I echo that clapping from afar, even though I wasn't in the audience. Here, I'm curious, uh, before we dive in with the sort of literal deep dive into the sardine run in a minute, uh, to bring you back into the broadcast, how many days a year are you on the road? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> probably, <laughs> obviously depends on the year um, and, and, and COVID and all these other things. But last year I spent probably more time on the road than I was off it. Um, not probably, definitely. This year I'm trying my hardest to stay home a little bit more just because I do think that stillness and, you know, like I love backpacking. I love traveling. I love adventure, but you need those moments of stillness in between to kind of really recalibrate and to reflect on what you've been through and really process everything. I like that message. Is there a place that's next? So, I mean, amidst the trying to keep for stillness, is there a, a next destination? <laughs> There's a perpetually never ending list of places I want to go. I'm, I'm literally staring at my scratch off map that I have on this wall opposite I... me and just thinking like, oh man, I really need to want to go to Madagascar. But um, I'm actually heading to Mexico next week to lead a, um, a diving expedition to hopefully photograph the mobula rays. And if we get lucky, some orcas. Uh, this is a really beautiful exciting expedition and then later on in the year have french polynesia coming up um where we'll be swimming with humpback whales uh which are some of my favorite animals and then back to africa mozambique and south africa later on um in like november december time fantastic i'm so glad you mentioned mozambique both in the ted talk and now it's such a special place and it's sort of uh, become on the tourist and world radar of exploration yes yeah. Um, and Mobular Rays, I just wanted to put this in the screen for people. You had a picture in the TED Talk of, of like hundreds of them around you. It's one of the coolest things in all of nature to have that opportunity. So I hope you have the, just the best time. That's so much fun. Well, 
Pierre, speaking of, of grand aggregations of wildlife and, and animals, I want to highlight the sardine run because uh, I grew up with David Attenborough as my hero, the BBC, Planet Earth, Blue Planet, all that stuff. And there's a series called Nature's Most Amazing Events. And so there's all these, there was the Serengeti migration, there's these other great tales. And the sardine run stands way above all of them. Like this is the <laughs> greatest aggregation of predators on the planet, uh, just off the coast of, of this wild continent on the wild coast. And so I want to play this little clip uh, to highlight a little bit more of it. And then we will dive in on our Q&A. So let me cue that up for everybody. And... Uh, Get uh, go on a little adventure together. Here we go, <laughs> folks. Right. Oh, I'll make it. Here we go. More volume. Oh, it wants to work. There we go. Perfect. Hmm. Uh, honestly, so you have millions of fish, you've got whales, you've got sharks, you've got dolphins, you've got, actually, I'm curious about this, Pierre, did you see gannets? Did you have the birds dive into the water? Yes, so we had tons and tons of gannets, and the gannets are actually your best friend, because once they start diving and plummeting down, that's a sure sign that there is a bait ball there. So that's how we actually try to find these bait balls, as you're on the ocean and you're looking for diving birds. And so I'm curious, for, for people who don't know, you have these birds that are about yay big and they're coming down at 100 kilometers an hour to dive right into the water. They can go down 40, 50 feet, spear the fish, grab the fish. And so when you're there with them, by the way, is there any risk they hit you? Like, does that happen to people? Well, I actually kind of have a funny story about that. <laughs> um, the sardine run is definitely probably the wildest expedition that I do and my personal favorite. Um, but the, this past year, that we, we last season, um, we had one of our, our guests who we always caution people, do not wear anything shiny, flashy, no jewelry, anything that can kind of look like a sardine. You don't want to look like the prey, right? But one of our clients had a shiny dive computer on, which is basically like a watch that, you know, measures your your depth and the temperature and all of that. And for some reason, it ended up catching the light at an angle. And one of the gannets thought it was a sardine and dove down and took a chunk out of his hand. <laughs> so he's like now has luckily we had um, some doctors on board and they actually were able to patch him up and he's totally fine. But he now has a really kind of like badass battle scar <laughs> from <laughs> this expedition where he got, you know, attacked by a gander essentially i thought he was a sardine that is i see i've heard of that before not going in with shiny things but i've never heard a story of someone with one so thank you for that <laughs> yeah. your, your poor diving friend. now you're a, not just a diver you're a photographer underwater and so i'm curious when you first picked up a camera and if you still have the first shots that you took just out of personal curiosity yeah, so I actually, um, the first time I ever went to South Africa, I think I was about 12 years old um, and was, you know, shooting a, a little point and shoot um, on safari, really, really fell in love with it on that trip and another um, subsequent trip to Iceland. So it was always like loved the camera, but then didn't really meld the underwater side with the photography side until about four years ago on a diving trip to the Socorro Islands, which is this tiny, tiny p pinnacle off of... Um, uh, off of Mexico, essentially the coast of Mexico takes two days sailing to get there. And that's where you can swim with these big ocean, like big, big manta rays that are very curious and follow you around and dolphins and all these big animals. So that's where I really um, fell in love with underwater photography. 
Fantastic. I always love uh, underwater shot story, so I appreciate that. Uh, teachers and YouTube groups, if you guys want to start getting ready with questions, put those thinking caps on, please do. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more before we get underway because we are like way early for time, which is a lot of fun. So, Beer, over COVID, you obviously did not get the chance to travel near as much as you would. What did you do during that time? How was that for a person who lives so much for adventure to not have that opportunity for several years? What did that feel like? Yeah, I mean, I actually did uh, slow down my travel in the sense that I would go somewhere and just spend longer instead of doing these, you know, like couple of day trips here and there that a lot of people tended to do, I think, pre-COVID. Slower travel is coming back now. And I, I personally think it's such a great way to experience the country because not only are you giving it the country kind of enough time to really sink in, you're just doing yourself uh, the, yourself and the country's service. Um also in terms of, you know, obviously carbon footprint and uh, flying and all of those things, I really would like to encourage anyone who's able to take that time to really go to a destination for more than just a couple of days. So I spent um, almost six months um, accumulatively in South Africa uh, over COVID. I did a, um, another like six months in Thailand back home where I'm from to be with family and to uh, do my dive masters. And yeah, I did a lot of other expeditions here and there, but definitely slower travel for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, let's head to our live groups. Uh, Madam Jen's class, one of our Men and Jen's joined us for like, I think, like 25 broadcasts this year. One of our all of our teachers. Uh, so if you want to kick us off with a question, and then we'll head to you, Ms. Sadati, in just a second. Welcome in, Madam Jen. Hi, thank you. Um, so, by the way, like, very interesting. You wouldn't necessarily think sardine runs are so exciting, but you just make it sound so interesting. So thank you very much. Uh, we were just curious, was there ever a time you were nervous or, like, scared, or have you actually been attacked underwater? So I've never been attacked and I tell people this all the time that I'm actually pretty like I'm naturally quite a scared person, which you wouldn't think seeing a lot of like the, the I don't know, I guess the footage or the, the animals that I swim with. But it all started because I was like, there is this fear in front of me. I want to face it. How do I tackle it? How do I get over it? I don't want to live my life in fear. And so the perfect example is at the first sardine run, you're basically on this this boat this rubber almost like a dinghy out in the ocean the open ocean with rough seas and once they start seeing the diving birds they prime you into position and the guides basically tell you to jump and i remember looking over the side of the boat and seeing like i think it was like a two meter long shark um that was right next to us feeding and was thinking i jump now and the guy turned and he was like isn't this what you're here for so i was like I mean, he has a point and I just jumped in. And so the whole point is not to not have fears. It's, I guess, to be scared, but then to try to find ways to conquer that fear and to think is, you know, is this actually something that's dangerous or is it just something that my mind is irrationally afraid of? Yeah, I really love this message. So we have both astronauts on and Jill Heiner, who's one of the world's top cave divers. And you oh, I love her work. She's such a, such an incredible, like underwater lady. Jill is the, the absolute best. And every talk she does, she talks about the fact that she's always afraid. Like she goes into everything she does afraid, but with a healthy respect for what she does. And so if you have that preparation, you help mitigate that fear and you recognize that what you're in is a date or potentially dangerous situation. I think that healthy kind of, uh, you know, fear is the perfect example of talk. Cause the thing is like, you know, sharks aren't, cuddly per se they're not pets they're not supposed to be tamed they are apex predators and demand that respect as does the ocean like the ocean can turn on you in a heartbeat and so to have that fear is i think a healthy thing it's just about kind of you know is that fear rational or am i just freaking myself out because i've seen jaws too many times <laughs> also, we love shark talks and we love highlighting this for students because universally like no matter how many times you relay this message classes are like oh sharks and I, I love that something that was done off the LA coast, right where you are, uh, about a year ago. Uh, researcher took drone photography just off the coast of all the swimmers and surfers and everything else. And there's great white sharks there all the time. That you know, there's like two around a person, or they're they're ten feet away, and they want nothing to do with people. Like sharks really will go out of their way to avoid you in most instances. Yes. And again, we like to highlight: coconuts get more people than sharks every year. Vending machines get more people than sharks every year, right? And so again, something to respect, not be terrified of. Uh, but on an animal note, uh, Miss Sadati, if you want to unmute your mic, turn on your camera, I'll come to you guys in just a second. But Abby joining us in St. Albert. Abby's been a huge fan of her oceans program. She wants to be a marine biologist when she grows up here. Uh, she wants to know how many sardines are in the bait ball when you're beside this pile of fish. How many fish? It really depends. So okay. sardine run bait balls, the ones you saw in the video, those are, you know, 
they're quite large, the size of sometimes even a room or a car, but they can actually stretch. These shoals can stretch for kilometers long. So oftentimes what we'll do is we'll send spotter planes, these little aircrafts overhead to scout the area ahead for us. And they will report shoals stretching just like kilometers or miles long. Um, it really just depends on the conditions. Right. Very cool. I like but the in terms of uh, the actual number of animals, it is the largest migration, larger in terms of number than even the wildebeest migration of the Maasai and Serengeti. So millions and millions of fish. I mean, it's, it's something if you see some of the longer footage of it, the full documentaries, they, they would be the equivalent of like blotting out the sun, but underwater. It's very cool. It looks like it. Essentially, yeah. Place. It's amazing. Um, Miss Michael's class couldn't attend live, but did share this question, which I'm sure you get all the time. And that is, do you have a favorite adventure? Most people don't. So if you do, I'd be very surprised. But any that really I can, I mean, the Sardinia Run is the, my obvious go-to one. I just have a very personal connection to that place. And it's still, for lack of a better term, still quite wild. It hasn't really been over-touristed yet. I also have, you know, would be remiss to not mention Antarctica. I had the immense privilege of going there um, in 2014 and spent Christmas Day with a quarter million penguins so that was a pretty oh. insane experience um they're very stinky though like just to know they're people think they're really cute but they just smell like salty bird poo essentially <laughs> you know what that could be the, the subtitle of our program and we put it leave it on youtube later it smells like salty bird poo the story of adventure um yeah. uh, mrs Audi, i want to bring you in so badly but your devices are off so please feel free to, to come on in anytime uh, while you're waiting for you uh madame jen i will come back in a second but mr walsh's class wants to know how long is the sardine run like how big an event is it is it a week so it actually is going on right now um june july is the best time to see <laughs> is the best time to see it it's every winter in the southern hemisphere so this is when the sardines are migrating up the coast they're chasing they're actually moving with the currents and so you want the water to be under a certain temperature for the sardines to actually run also it has nothing to do with running a marathon i've had so many people ask like oh you run marathons i'm like no i definitely do not the starting run is purely underwater first of all i would be very shocked if at some point just by virtue of the fact that you get this question a lot that you don't just run a marathon <laughs> i really don't know what's keeping you at this point honestly um but i love that you mentioned the temperature thing so this is really interesting i think as as land animals you know we recognize that the arctic's colder than the desert and whatnot but people don't think that way for the ocean and so the fish will stay in a very narrow band of water that is their temperature that suits them and they won't go outside of that and that helps allow the predators to sort of hone in on them people say oh why don't the fish just dive way down and get away they don't because it's not something that they could live in it's like us if we went without clothes into the arctic that would not be a good time and so i think that that's a, a really important thing to highlight for our classes yeah and i think um, that's the thing too is um something we love to highlight is you know it's really easy sometimes to distance yourself from these global events happening you're like oh that doesn't affect me that doesn't but once you've actually share the ocean with these animals once you've seen them up close and personal you inevitably start to care and for example the sardine run is so heavily influenced by climate and actually seeing that vary from year to year and also how the local communities are you know affected by the fish because they also they, they they're reliant on the fish as a food source it is definitely affected by climate and Recently, there was a very controversial issue of uh, Shell, the oil company, drilling um, and doing some or some doing some seismic testing off of the Wild Coast, and which would have potentially affected the whales, dolphins, all the animals in the area. And so there was a huge outcry um, from the environmental sector trying to like get them to stop, essentially. But that's just yeah. another, one of the many examples of what goes on in the world right now. Well, thank you for highlighting, uh, answering a question before it was even asked. I was just going to ask that back, so I appreciate that. And no, marine acoustics and, and marine development is something that's underpinned a lot of what we've been talking about for Ocean's Week. And again, you know, some of these resources are essential for mankind and are essential for sort of the standard of life that we have, but it needs to be done in a way that doesn't impact wildlife. And I think we've slowly but surely learned that over the last few decades is that, wow, we can do this without being right in a migratory loop or without affecting something like the sardine run. Yeah. And I think you know, there are positive signs that people are starting to take action on behalf of, of wildlife and, and wild habitat. So I think that's Yeah, and it's not all, I mean, it, it is really terrifying, but it's not all doom and gloom. Like on the plus side, like, you know, a couple of decades ago, whales were on the verge of extinction and now there are more humpback whales than there ever were before. So that's because the world came together and was like, we got to do something. We got to like fight whaling. And this is what happens when the world comes together to help wildlife. Whaling is always the perfect example. So few people bring it up. So I appreciate that very much. Um, Madam Jen, come on in if you have a question for us again. 
Hey. Hi, yeah, actually, they have quite a few questions. Uh, so we're curious, like, what was your deepest dive? And have any animals, like, interacted with you and any of them that were, like, larger than you? Cool. I love those questions. Um, so there's two diving depths I'd love to talk about. One is for scuba diving, which the deepest I've done is probably just shy of 40 meters. I generally don't like to dive super deep, mostly because a lot of the animals hang out closer to the surface. The light is better for photography and you're just mitigating, or you're kind of minimizing risk when you're diving shallower. And then the other one is for free diving. So I actually was in Southern Thailand um, this past month uh, doing a free diving course down there with Alexei Molchanov and Adam Stern, who are, Alexei Molchanov is, holds the world record for the deepest man in the world, 131 meters on a single breath, which is Wow. insane um i've gotten down to 25 meters on a single breath but that is really enough to kind of you know swim with the animals and interact with them and you know on your second question animals are actually very curious especially if you're going to places where they haven't seen humans before for example the galapagos islands um antarctica being one of them i had a, a penguin chick literally almost crawl into my lap as I was sitting there photographing it. It just crawled in and started biting on my lens hood. Um, I've had manta rays follow me, as I mentioned. Uh, dolphins interact. They're, they're really quite curious. And sharks actually like the electro, um, kind of the electronic shutter sounds that your camera makes sometimes. So they'll come check you out. It's, I think as long as you're respecting them and you're not encroaching and not chasing them, they actually, a lot of the times will come to you. Yeah. Fascinating. I, 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 anyway, I love that. This really, really cool. <laughs> um, you talked about Galapagos too. So classically, it's a place where so many animals come to see people, which is quite amazing, actually, given the number of tourists that go there and given the number of people, the fact that that's still the case where sea lions will come, especially and, and check people out, I think is really, really neat. Um, Mrs. Dottie's class, I'm going to bring you in. I really want you to share a question if you have one. Uh, you were in in the beginning. If you want to, let me know. You can type in the chat and I can share it that way. And if not, that's okay too. Uh, Madam Jen, if you do have another live question, I'll come back to you guys. Up to you. Uh, yeah. So a, a little bit more random for this one, but um, of course we're obsessed with uh, oxalots because they're like really cute. Have you ever seen one in the wild? <laughs> I have not personally. No. And so I actually have a list of things that I really want to see. Um, but the top of the list is actually a mola mola for me. Yes. <laughs> Which and for those of you, if you guys know, they're really derpy looking. They're also called sunfish. They basically mm -hmm. hang out at the, at the top, you know, sunbathing and like, or, or like they're they're just very strange animals. And I've gone on trips to try to find them, uh, and in the Galapagos included. And just for some reason, they always evade me. So people are chasing, like they want to see a blue whale. I'm like, I've seen a blue whale. I've literally seen this. Like, I've never seen a sunfish. <laughs> One day. So, okay, what else is on the list, though? So, Mola Mola, by the way, thank you for calling them derpy. Very few people do that in our program. <laughs> that they are. They're really quite derpy. Um, I think they're the world's densest animal. Like, not mentally. Yes. I mean, like, they're just, like, bone <laughs> density. Very heavy. And uh, they're, yeah, they're just, they just look bizarre. Um, yeah. But I've really wanted to photograph one for a while now. And then what else is on the list? Like, is there anything else um, that people know readily? So I just crossed off wild dugongs recently. Ooh, we got to see cool. them in southern Thailand. They, it's a really cool story in the um, in the way that actually during COVID, when there were less tourists in the area, the Thai dugongs made a comeback and started coming back to like feast on the seagrass in the area. There's, I think, almost 200 now in the population. So my partner and I went down there recently to try to photograph them underwater. No one has ever photographed a Thai dugong underwater before. So that was our mission. And we ended up capturing some beautiful footage of them on drone so that was one that was recently crossed off last month and then the other one that i would love to see underwater i've actually never swam underwater as an orca Ooh, see it's yeah. so funny with orcas because we've been highlighting them a bunch over the last little bit and really if they ever took it in their mind to want to attack people they would win uh they are the ape like the apex predator of the ocean everyone should look up an orca skull when you're done this program it's the most metal thing in the history of nature like no dinosaur skull comes close to an orca they hunt great whites they hunt blue whales like there's nothing mm -hmm. that escapes them and they're they're super super cool i hope you get so that the joke that i make is like if you know dolphins are the jocks of the, of the ocean. Um, you know, they're super cool. They hang out in pods. Uh, sharks are 100% the misunderstood emo kids. Like I was probably a shark in high school. <laughs> and then the um, orcas are like the, the kids who are smart and good at everything and like kind of sometimes bullies and like, yeah, but they're just the top, top, top apex predator. So um, um, 
<laughs> well, I, I wish you well in your, your journey for them, certainly in Mexico. I hope you get that chance. And I wanted to share for people, before we take our last question, because time flies and you're having fun, I wanted to show people the Mola Mola really quickly because they are amazing. We actually hosted an entire Mola Mola festival a year ago with like 20 programs on them. It was a ton of fun. Uh, they were so weird. And they're the heaviest bony fish in the world. So all the bigger fish than them are all cartilaginous. They're sharks. So whale sharks, great whites get heavier, but they all don't have that heavy bone, which is what makes them the densest creature. Um, Maybe, you know what, you said not mentally. I'm not sure that's the case. They could be done <laughs> in your case. It, well, to be determined. You can find one and let us know. Um, here, is there a, a sort of final message? We've got kids that are yearning for adventure. That's the whole shtick that we have at Exploring by the Seed of Your Pants. Excited to get out and explore. Uh, what was an important first step for you that we can inspire kids with today, wherever they're joining from around the world? I mean, I think the thing to remember is that we all start off as kids at some point, right? All yearning and dreaming and having these aspirations. And I used to tour quite a few schools talking to kids about um, my, my the books that I wrote um, about mermaids and why fantasy. And people would always ask, like, I want to write a book. How do I start? Or I always want to. And I always tell them, like, I'm literally just like the rest of you. And I'm I started off as a kid with a dream and just followed through with it. And so if you have a curiosity or passion for something, do your reading, research it and get out there because the world really is your oyster. And there are so many magical, wonderful places to discover both on land and biasly under the sea. Well, I can't think of a better message than that. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today so early. I hope you get the chance to get out to the water for rollers. <laughs> um, and we wish you the very best in all your adventures. I, I just really appreciate you joining us for Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And for our live audience or YouTube, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I hope you can catch more of our programs throughout the day. And if you want to check out more about your amazing work, she's got a really awesome website. She's on Instagram with some of the coolest pictures you've ever seen in your entire life, as we've got a chance to see some of in the TED Talk today. So do check those out. And for now, I'll say farewell. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Pierre, best of luck and adventures.